Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. It's okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, got it. My computer isn't working today, so I swapped the slides over to the PC, which sometimes, you know, they're Mac PC issues, so I haven't looked at what's happened. So some of the slides will look differently, and we will just see how that goes. So this week, I am switching gears. Last week, I gave a series of lectures on viral ecology, and I promised this week I'll do a series of lectures on viral epidemiology and epidemics. So my plan, as I will explain in a few minutes, is to give you a broad overview this morning, and then tomorrow and Wednesday get into more of the mathematical foundations of some of the concepts that I introduced today. So at various points today, I might go a little bit quickly through a concept or even just give you the, the gestalt, the essence of the idea. And Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll fill in some of the foundations. And Thursday, you'll get a chance to do a number of these things for yourselves. This is going to be a bit of an unconventional lecture in the sense that rather than trying to start from perceived basic foundations that we all agree upon, I'm going to try to illustrate. Someone has a laptop that is doing feedback. So I'm going to try to illustrate what happens when you take epidemic principles and put them into practice. So showing you some of those principles, but also showing you some of the fragility of them and try to address some of those uh, throughout the course of the lecture. This image is a collaboration. I, I like starting with this in this context. It's a collaboration between an undergraduate at Georgia Tech and a scientist in our group trying to depict some of the intent of what we tried to do, which is this is, comes from a risk map that I'll tell you more about today that tries to express the odds that one or more individual might be infected in groups of different sizes and tries to do this in real time and communicate and also trying to keep in mind why we're doing it, which I think you can understand here from the image itself. So uh, I can already tell all the fonts will be different and unexpected and who knows, and they won't be spaced. So if you notice all the fonts look strange and it doesn't look well placed, I will release a PDF in which the fonts are the right fonts and they look like they're in the right position. Okay, so I'm going to talk today as an introduction about modeling interventions and still this ongoing need. There's a lot of room and opportunity for people who are sharp or are quantitative, but who also want to commit to understanding how epidemics work to get involved, I will, in some sense, build up to three different applications. So I'm not going to jump there immediately, but I'll build up to these different applications of what we have tried to do. And there's a long list of folks who have supported this work, and I think it's important, especially in this context, to highlight them. I'll try to mention them as I go. So I was supposed to be here a while back. We had met in Brazil at some point, and was it in 2019 or maybe? It was January 2019, and I was supposed to come earlier. Obviously, we all know that a lot of these meetings were not possible. The fall of that same year, a little bit before, I think I was going to come out in 2020. Originally, that was the plan. We were going to sort it out. I teach a quantitative biosciences class. You saw a little bit of it last week in terms of some of the modalities of how we teach using lectures and laboratories. And one of our sections is on epidemics. And I think you can probably see this, but if not, I'll, I'll just read it. One of the homework problems took a conventional epidemic model and then just asked, what happens uh, if we have a new epidemic with an airborne transmitted disease like SARS in which individuals usually count 50 people, there's a sort of average incubation duration. And then I go in to ask, what happens if people start to wear masks, which reduce the spread to zero? However, compliance scales with disease and incidence such that the fraction of individual wearing masks, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, you know, this is unfortunate. I try not to write catastrophic problem sets and then have those things happen into the future, but groups like ours were already thinking about many of these same issues. What happens when you have disease outbreaks and you have behavior? And what happens if the behavior is not perfect, right? And so there were some ways in which our group and others were already thinking about some of these things. And we even asked the question, how would you design a public health policy surrounding mask wearing? What level of compliance would you need to have to stop disease outbreaks, right? And so it's, we're all sitting in this room wearing masks. I think in France, probably as of today, I think they're gonna stop certain requirements. I don't know if in Italy, the same thing is happening, okay. No, there's some shaking of heads, so I'm not sure. Uh, 
In France, there's an election. Maybe you don't have an election coming up. So some of these things are not just driven by public health. They're driven by other issues as well. OK, so I'm going to go back in time and recall, and I'll try to draw us through an arc that begins in 2020, some, uh, some sense of what we understood early on in terms of two key features as to why the world was alarmed, is alarmed, and still remains uncertain about how to address SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. One of the reasons is that there, is a, there was a sense very early that this was quite transmissible. It had the potential on the x-axis is the basic reproductive number, which I will explain throughout the course of talk, which talks about the average number of new infections from a single infectious individual and otherwise susceptible population. And there was a sense, you know, it was about two or three or four, something around in that range. And then the other parts, that means it could reach a lot of people. The other part that was concerning was the y-axis, which is either the case fatality rate or the infection fatality rate. And there was more uncertainty at the beginning of how bad it actually was with SARS and MERS and you know, things like Ebola above, which are uh, highly lethal in terms of the effects they have on individuals. This one had a bit more range and it was clear it wasn't anything like the seasonal coronaviruses, but nonetheless, there was some uncertainty. And I bring up these two terms, infection fatality rate and case fatality rate, to distinguish the fact that the case fatality is what, what we measure. We count cases, count fatalities, divide one by the other. The problem is that the denominator, even the numerator in certain countries is hard to estimate, but certainly the denominator is very hard. We're not always sure if we identified all the cases. And so some of the uncertainty there was, well, perhaps we were only capturing only one out of every two cases or one out of every five or one out of every 10. And some people speculate we're only capturing one out of every 50 or 100, in which case, it wasn't that much different than the flu or even common cold. Obviously, those were not true. We knew very early those were not true. Nonetheless, there's an issue there between what we observe and what we'd like to know. We can't know directly the x-axis, and we can't even know directly the y-axis when we don't ascertain all the cases. And so in the first year, there were very few, if almost no, ways to intervene pharmaceutically. There were non-pharmaceutical interventions. In the last year, there were vaccinations and still very few effective pharmaceuticals, treatments, at least not widely available. And unfortunately, this is a problem that's going to persist in terms of future years. How do we face variance waves? How do we test, treat, and how can we make this theory useful? And I'm sorry that things are being cut off out of my control by the fonts and, and uh, Mac to Windows conversion. But I hopefully, I'll be able to communicate what you can't necessarily see on the slides. Okay. So we can make certain kinds of choices when we begin to think about how to model epidemics and then again how to make it useful. Obviously we could start simple and for the most part I will start simple but I'll build in complexity and I'll reinforce Tuesday and Wednesday. We could take a population and divide it up into different categories. For example, those who are infected, those who are susceptible and so on. And forget about all the ways that people live and exist in space. And of course we could also change that and address the fact that proximity matters. Right? We're not all interacting with all like particles in a heat bath, right? Or bacteria and viruses in a chemostat. And of course, we could think about it in terms of continuous space and really think about the waves and way in which things move uh, across and even think about networks and so on. And each one of these begins to imply a certain kind of mathematical uh, formalism and methodology that we might use, things like ordinary differential equations, network models, maybe even PDEs to describe interactions and dynamics. And it's true that the latter two are more realistic, but from an intuition side, actually you can get quite far using these ODEs. On the other hand, you have to be very cautious when you try to apply them because of many of the assumptions and simplifications you use just to make some intuition also mean that if you try to apply them in practice, this may be fraught. Okay, so let me introduce the simplest version of one of these kind of model classes. And it contains things that I'm sure many of you, if not almost all of you have already heard or thought about, but it also contains some nuances that I expect that some of you, maybe most of you, nearly all of you have not thought about. So there's still stuff to learn from this very basic model. So let me first define the way that we're going to set up the model. We have a population. We're going to think of it divided up into fractions. You can think of these as uh, 
densities or rescaled by the total population size so that we have fractions of the population that are susceptible, infectious, or recovered, and or removed, but we'll think of it as recovered for now. Infectious individuals come into contact with susceptible individuals at some rate beta, there's a transmission event, and the infectious individuals recover over a time period, characteristic time period, TI. So we could take some of the same methodologies that I talked about last week and write down a coupled set of nonlinear differential equations. And here I've kept the end, but you can rewrite everything in terms of fractions, where we have the derivative here, S is always going down due to infections. Infectious in individuals increase because of new infections. There's a recovery period, and we're moving those infectious individuals into that recovered class. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward in terms of the setup. And if we add these up, then we see that we've preserved the number. We're not worrying necessarily at the moment about fatalities or births that would put in new individuals into the susceptible category. And so we're ignoring demographics for now. Right? So we're sort of on a short epidemic time scale. If we take such a model and then try to evaluate what happens, we see that we get these characteristic outbreaks in which the number of susceptible people go down, the infectious go up and then down, and the recovered also goes up. And I'll just anticipate sort of how we're going. It's, it looks a little tricky here on this y-axis, but in this, it, it, I guess it, in, for any sort of realistic epidemic using this model framework, who here thinks that everyone eventually gets infected? There are no more susceptible people left. So raise your hand, you think everyone gets infected. Okay, about, now I'm getting some more, about half. Who here thinks not everyone gets infected? Okay, we're about split. Obviously, in this example, it's set up in a kind of funky way, so it looks like it asymptotically approaches one. I'll actually get into that in a little bit. It turns out that, at least from the theoretical side, not everyone is expected to be infected. In fact, from these models, it predicts that there's always some fraction, no matter how high our naught is, of individuals who are not infected. So it doesn't actually reach everyone, which I'll explain. There's some other issues that's called a final size relationship. Although obviously in this diagram, it looks like it goes up towards one. But let's think not about the end, but about the beginning. And in thinking about the beginning, we should ask the question, just like we asked, in the viral ecology section, just because you have a virus can infect a host doesn't mean that it spreads at the population level. Just because we have an emergent infectious disease, diseases are always popping out at some low level from zoonotic reservoirs, doesn't mean all of them end up becoming pandemic, obviously very few at this scale. At the beginning, we can ask the question, what would happen when nearly everyone is susceptible? In other words, we're nearly all immunologically naive. And unfortunately, that is more or less what was happening in January, February, March, 2020. And in doing so, we can rewrite this DIDT equation, replacing S right, with something approaching one, S over N with approaching one, so that we pull out an I, and we see if we pull out a, a one over TI, we get beta TI minus one over TI as a factor multiplying the small number of infectious individuals. So this is nothing other than making an assumption or linearizing the system around the disease-free equilibrium. Okay. So if we had taken the same procedure and done the complicated routine of finding the fixed points and linearizing, we would find out that our infected subsystem has this characteristic dynamics, which means that whether or not it takes off depends on whether or not that thing is greater than zero, which really means if that part is greater than one. Okay, if the product of the rate of infection times the period of infection is more than one, that implies that that infectious individual causes more than one other infectious individual. In other words, generates more than one other infectious individual during their infectious period, during their lifetime. If that's true for that one individual, that's true for the next two or three, and it's true also for them. And you can see how this leads to exponential takeoff. We identify that 
red box number as R0. The number of infections caused by a single infectious individual and otherwise susceptible population. It's a dimensionless number. The speed of takeoff is not. So we can think of this as a threshold criteria. We can think of the speed as akin to the eigenvalue. So one has a rate and one is a criteria that turns out to be dimensionless. Any questions about this? Okay. So, and, and I should also ask, I assume many of you have seen these concepts before. Plus I talked about them last week, so I reinforce. Any questions before I move on to a puzzle? Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, the box thing, I should have, yeah, I probably should have made the boxes on the right color. I can't tell what's happening with the colors. They're, they're the same thing, right? That product of beta times CI is R naught. Okay. And we'll go through in more complex models later in the week exactly how to define it when it's not this simple case. Okay, so now many of you have seen this before. Here I've constructed a synthetic example where I've taken a look at the number of infectious individuals over time as a function of days and some synthetic outbreak that I've generated on the computer. And I've set R0 of 1.5. So I've made that product of beta uh, times TI and I've set it to 1.5. And I get this kind of dynamic. Right, it takes off. Now I went to the computer and I changed R0 to two. And then I changed it to 2.5. As you will see, and I added some noise to imagine that the actual numbers change from day to day, the actual number of infectious individuals change beyond that expectation from a deterministic model. And in fact, these curves don't actually include as much stochasticity as would be the case if we had such small numbers. That's an aside. But I've just added some noise, not process noise, just some noise on top. And you'll notice that they look identical. I think most people have this idea that R0, as it goes up, should make a difference in terms of these curves. Right? Does anyone have any idea how is this, what, what happened here? Why is this possible? Other than me making a mistake, I certainly can multiply numbers together. How did, was I able to get three identical curves with very different values of R0? I mean, these are dramatically different in terms of their impact potential. Someone from the class here who's just waking up, there's not enough coffee drunk this morning, I can tell. People are studying for the afternoon exams. How is it possible? How can I get totally different outcomes? Yes? So, so the, the possibility is maybe we're starting with a very low number, and the dynamics sort of look the same for a while, and then maybe we'll diverge. Is that a hypothesis? Okay. Anyone else have a speculation? Yes? On the side. Since we expanded it around us almost equal to one, maybe this is the rate, the, I mean, the condition for which the infection starts, but then why would we expect different results for later? Okay. So we expanded around some disease for equilibrium. So perhaps that uh, they're going to all, it seems like a similar uh, hypothesis. Maybe I misunderstood. Are, are you wondering if they all started somewhere near the same, but I have these parameters? No, you're, I don't understand your hypothesis. Can you repeat it? I was trying to repeat, but I don't understand. I, I mean, we said that we defined that in that way, but uh, we, uh, we computed that by assuming that S is almost equal to one. So why would we... Can we say anything about uh, what happens later? I don't know. Ah, okay, fine, interesting. So ah, that we've made some assumption that, I get it, that we, it's only linearization, but now we're in some nonlinear mode, so well, why do we even get to speculate? So these numbers, as it turns out, are still so small that our linearization is probably appropriate, as you'll see in a moment. So we're still in the linear regime. We have different takeoff rates. And let me just show you in a moment what I've done and what I've constructed, which is actually there is a divergence later but it's not because they always need to be the same. I built this intentionally to show that there's an identifiability problem at the beginning of outbreaks, which is that you can get the same initial growth rate for very different underlying reasons that only later will be revealed. 
which is not due to some linearization, non-linearization issue, but it's due to a fundamental identifiability problem. If you just measure the speed, you don't actually know the R naught and why. Well, it's the product of two numbers. And so obviously when I did this, I played a little game and changed something so that the speed, which is not that product, you weren't looking carefully at that a moment ago, but it was R naught minus one divided by Ti. So I am able to keep the speed the same while changing the R naught. I have two things that I can change at once. I'll explain more intuition in a second. Yes, Mateo. Please question. Um, suggest in the chat, maybe because we are assuming the population is fully connected in the simulation. That is certainly the case. And these models this morning, they're, they're all connected. And so it's certainly true that if we were to look at structural differences in the population, we'd have different kinds of outcomes. We'd have to use network theory and not just this sort of well-mixed theory. But what I'm talking about here has a simpler notion when we get to populations. Let me just go back here for a moment and remind you that before I made the box narrow, this in some sense is the speed that I observe but it's the product of transmissibility and the infectious period. And it's possible to keep this constant while actually changing that product of beta times TI. And I'll now try to give you some intuition for that. And I'm moving the wrong computer ahead. That one's not on. So let me just explain these concepts as I went through it, which is, this is the speed. This is what we were measuring early on in early 2020. How fast were things going up? I use different strengths, and it's often what theorists and epidemic modelers want to find out. The reason why they often want to find it out is that the thing that is a stronger disease, even though the observable may be the same, later on, the total size in terms of the peak, the duration, the total number of infected is related to the strength. So the idea is you have this observable, the speed, from that, if you knew certain things, you could infer the strength, and from the strength, you could make predictions about the size. And obviously, if you knew something about infections, fatalities, you would even say something about severity. So you can see why there's this preoccupation, even though the public is often just interested in this. I mean, what do they care about this unobservable that's sitting below? Right? This obviously matters. And in fact, thinking about speed rather than strength is often, I think, probably something that's not done as well or not as focused on for various reasons. But this gives you this idea that just because you observe something, there could be different underlying reasons. And those reasons then have consequences later as we move outside of this linearized regime. Okay. So many values of R0 can be compatible with the same observer rate, even if the outbreak sizes are different. So we have this notion of observing the speed, inferring the strength, predicting the size. Okay. This link not only is conceptually interesting and actually I think a bit challenging, not as well understood, not even in some fact, uh, sectors of the public health world, but you can begin to see if I look at two comparisons and I'm gonna use the word generation interval, which I will unpack more this week, more formally. Right? So I'm doing some things today in which I'm gonna tell you maybe unsatisfactorily a bit about something, but I need to do that because otherwise it won't even make sense why I'm investing the time in the mathematics later in the week. So that you can think about the generation interval as the period between which an infector infects others, right? And I will unpack even more of what that means later. In our case, we could think of it as just simply the value of TI for now, because that's the average time it takes for me to infect others. And if I have the same observables here, this is in terms of incidence rather than prevalence. Incidence is the number of new cases weekly. Prevalence is the total number of individuals who are infected. You see these are the same curves. If the generation intervals are shorter, in other words, if the average infection period is smaller, then the reproduction number you infer is smaller. Whereas if the generation intervals are longer, the reproduction number you infer is larger. You can see this intuitively with this diagram. You can see that here on the, your right, we have longer generation intervals, which means that over this period, right, 
we get the same number of final cases, but we only went through two generations, which means the average number of infections per infectious period must be bigger. Whereas the one on the left, we have faster generations. It's kind of burning through this more quickly. And on average, the number of infections per infectious period is going to be less. So R0 is smaller. Now, if you're a member of the public, I don't think you really care which one of the, you see this many people infected by the end, that seems equally bad. In the long run, it turns out this may have a different kind of effect, but in the near term, these things are taking off at the same speed, okay? So this is implicit and says that if you wanna figure out something about how strong the disease is, you make your observation and you need to do something about the generation interval, how long the periods are and how transmissible they are. We tend not to know how transmissible these things are. And so people try to have a sense of, well, how long are you infected for? What is the typical period? When are you typically infecting others? It turns out we're not always even sure about that, especially for emerging infectious diseases. So this explains how early on when you see certain headlines, and I, I admit that my headlines will be drawn mostly from the United States, not entirely. You can understand things like this, which was April 7th, COVID-19 may be twice as contagious as previously thought. Because we had been working on generation intervals for quite some time and building methodologies. As soon as I saw this kind of title and someone is hiding a video panel, I'm not doing it, it's not me. So uh, I'm here, not touching the mouse. As soon as one sees a title like this, colleagues, uh, we decided and kind of looked into it a little bit more, maybe, yeah, there we go. No more meeting controls. To me, that sounded like there wasn't any new data out. It sounded to me like someone had made a different assumption about intervals. So if they think that the intervals are longer, you immediately can get a higher R naught. And that's what this title means. And so this title means if you make a different assumption about generation intervals, then you infer from the same data a very different value of R0, and that's what they actually did. So you see these R0, these distributions, and you can see the patterns in terms of the assumption, given a given growth rate, if you vertically move up and you see the R0 using their different simulations, you can see that as the interval, and now they're using a serial interval, which is just the time between my, when my symptoms show up and the symptoms of the person I infect show up, it's different than a generation interval, but for reasons I'll explain later, you see that as these timings go up, so does the R0 for the same condition upon the same observable, right? So it really becomes an issue that people are dealing with assumptions. These assumptions matter. And now, no, okay, good. So we went into that and tried to reconcile this in a JRSI paper very early on. You'll notice the receipt date we were already on this sort of in February. I mean, it was one of the first things we were doing, trying to understand how we could even estimate or not. And what we realized is that the reason that people differed on their estimates of or not was largely because they had very different ideas of the generation interval and even things like dispersion, whether it was exactly at a certain time or had variability. Because all of this is going to make an impact. The more variability you have, the more early transmission you have. The more early transmission you have, that sort of moves things to the left. And there was even differences in terms of estimates of the growth rate, but for the most part, that was the same and with these other things uh, that differed. Speed and strength are linked. This is also relevant for new variants, and you can even do it in the background of old variants. So these same concepts of trying to figure out are the new variants have the same generation intervals as the old variants. It's not just about transmissibility. It's also about how long and when things are transmiss transmitting. Excuse me. Okay, so I'll just point out that when you incorporate all this variability, even though there's much larger point estimates, what we realize is that they were really just making different assumptions about generation intervals. And we ended up with a conclusion that R0 was about three, plus or minus one to 1.5-ish. And, and I will talk about this, I think on Wednesday, I will unpack exactly how you use generation intervals in a more formal way. I'm giving you the output of what happens when you do. Okay. I started with this basic model, showed you how 
we can, in this very simplified sense, mathematically, this is not very complicated to show that there's this takeoff speed. I showed you speed and strength are linked. And then I showed you empirically from the simulation that yes, hey, there's could be this issue at the final size so that the things that look the same early diverge later. Okay. This is what final size relationships tend to look like. All of these are starting with a disease-free equilibrium near that susceptible fraction is one. This is the IS plane. It can't ever go into that upper right section because S plus I plus R must be less than or equal to one. And so I know that S plus I must be less than or equal to one. So I can't go over there. What can happen though, is the disease takes off more and more infected people, depleting susceptibles, and we fall back down. You'll notice that we land on this axis, the disease is done, but the susceptible fraction is not zero. If everyone had been infected, all of these curves, irrespective of R naught, will all would all be attracted to this point. But they're not. In fact, they're attracted to a whole continuum of fixed points. There's an entire line of fixed points down here. Not to say they're all stable, but there's actually a continuous line of stable fixed points and a continuous line of unstable fixed points. And they're separated by a certain boundary point. But you can see they all move down and you can also see that as the shading of this line gets a little darker, implying R naught gets higher, it moves farther and farther to the left. Okay. This is from a simulation, but it turns out you can do this yourselves. I don't know if anyone wants to try. I feel like today people need to try to do something. So I think you're, you're too worried about your exam later today. You didn't sleep enough. If I have I dot, no, let me do it the other way around. S dot is minus beta S I, and I dot is beta S I minus gamma I. You can see that I can take that ratio and get something like that. Okay, so why don't you take two minutes and see that I've given you a step forward. You can maybe see where I'm going. I suggest that you could write the relationship between every change in I, small change in I with respect to a small change in S, and you might be able to integrate that and find something. So understand what I'm trying to get you to do. So just take a moment and see if you can figure out if I started over there, I had an R naught, where I would end up. So there's a simulation. Could you have actually predicted where these final points are? Does everyone understand my question? Does anyone not understand what the heck I'm talking about, which is okay. So professor, do we have to, to write the, a small variation of I in function of a small variation of S? Who is asking that question? Uh, from online, sorry. I am. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> So that was very good. I looked around the room. I didn't see anyone who had a secret mic. Thank you for your, so repeat your question. Now that I see that the, I shouldn't be looking at people in the room, can that question be repeated? No, I just wanted to, to understand. Uh, we have to write a small variation of i in function of a small variation of s. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Correct. So why don't you try to do that? I've given you the hint. The hint is on there, and just take two minutes or so to try to write it out. If we do this, I don't have to do it on Tuesday or Wednesday anyway, which is fine. Remember, we've gotten into this mode because we found these parameters, link strength and speed, and we care about doing that because we think that strength relates to the final size. So if we could actually figure out strength early, we might be able to warn people earlier and know how to prioritize interventions. Just take two minutes if you want to try to do it. <laughs> 
maybe just another 60 seconds, just so you kind of go through some of the processes here. And you see that it's actually possible. If you do it, you're gonna probably have a problem. You need some initial condition. So I will give you the hint. Here's already the hint, but initially keep in mind that S is basically one and I is basically zero, but you seem to wanna to know a final condition, right? Cause that's what you're trying to figure out. Keep in mind the other hint is there. At the final moment, the thing that you wanna know, S infinity, I'm trying to ask you to figure it out, but what is I infinity at the end? Right. Well, yeah, it's the, the beauty of Mac to Windows conversion. It's a problem, still doesn't work. I will try to fix my laptop tomorrow so I can, actually, you know, tomorrow I'm doing on the board, so it won't matter. I will post the slides without all these funny things going on. Another 30 seconds, and I want to keep moving ahead here, just keeping mindful of the time. All right, so we know the initial conditions. You're trying to figure out the final value but you know something else which is gonna help you anchor you. I know people are still doing it, but I'm gonna move a little forward. Is that okay? Can I move forward? Okay. So you can imagine, you take the ratio here, you move ds to the other side, you integrate, you probably got something that looked like this. Some relation between i and s with a log. Initially, s is one, i is zero. So you can see that you can figure out this integration constant. And if you do that, you can figure out the last bit, which, oh my goodness, you can't see anything there. Did you get something that looks like that? Did anyone get there? Okay, well, you get a relationship between S infinity and it's defined by R naught, right? So it is not a closed, form solution, but nonetheless, you have this algebraic relationship that you can then use to solve for any value of R naught, you can get this final size. But even before the final size, I wanna point out that something happens interesting first, which is, oh, we don't have a wet cloth today, which is that this becomes zero, right? And it becomes zero not just because i is zero, but it starts to go down. Right? And before it can go down, it must have zero. And this is true when s equals gamma over beta, or when s is one over r naught. Which means when the susceptible population has been drawn down, and remember, we only have liftoff when r naught is greater than one in theory, the higher the strength is, the population gets lower and lower before we start to see decreases in case counts. Okay. So if you can imagine for a moment, which I will unpack more, here's time. We have something like this for our infection. And then we have something that's like this for our susceptible. This point here where it, the infections start to decrease must coincide where the susceptible is one over R naught. And I probably should have dropped it lower, but I didn't put scales, so it's okay. Which implies that the outbreak size at that point is one minus one over R naught. That many people have been infected at the moment when we have herd immunity. This level, says that 
enough people are infected around me so that the disease, rather than infecting three, right, would no longer necessarily infect three because maybe two thirds of the people already have been infected. So you can imagine, here's my focal individual. Here are nine people nearby. Imagining that R naught is about three. Initially, right, initially you would get one, two, and three on average, and the disease would continue to take off, right? Now imagine later on where we have, you can see here when S is only one third, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These have already been infected. So now if I choose three random people to infect, then maybe on average, I'll only get this one and here I'll waste and I'll waste the infection in some sense. I'm anthropomorphizing from the perspective of the virus, but there's, instead of having three new infections, I will actually be down to one because the transmission is weighted by S over N or here just the S the fraction. And now here's the case where S is only one over R naught or one third, only one third of the folks were susceptible at this point. This is the herd immunity threshold. Here is the initial. Yes. Sure. Why don't you include the recovery? Because it seems that it's important here. The folks here, they're either in actively infected or they've recovered. Yes, it's quite important. The reason why I don't include, this is the outbreak size. Uh, maybe I see what your point is. The outbreak size means the total number of people who are no longer susceptible. They are clearly now into the recovered class. So if we look at the end, the end result is S infinity, I infinity is zero, and R infinity is one minus S infinity. S plus I plus R is one, so I don't need to explicitly keep track of it. But when I get that end of the disease, no one is infected. Here's our solution for the S infinity. Anyone else must be recovered. The reason why we get herd immunity is because at that point, the susceptible fraction is down to a third. Everyone else is either infected or recovered. So very important. That's actually the basis for it. Now, if I were to draw the recovered fraction, it's going to go up and up and up. And whatever this gap is, is equal to this gap. Okay. I want to make another point here that people talked about reaching herd immunity. Do you remember when people talked about reaching herd immunity early on? I don't know what it's called in Italian, but herd immunity, you, you know what I mean. The problem with that is there's something called overshoot. Even though you reach it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the number of infections is zero. You just reach the replacement value. There are a number of infections that are still to happen even after herd immunity is reached and even in the simplified model. Okay, so even that idea that somehow if we got to herd immunity, which itself was problematic and wrong for a million and one reasons, even in the simplified model has another level of problem, which it doesn't mean the end of the disease. It just means that in theory, that infected person has an equal number of new infected people, but there are a lot of infected people to replace. So you still get what is called epidemic overshoot and quite a lot. Okay. Fine. I'm still in the introduction part, but I have three examples that I want to go through. It's about an hour. It'll be fine. I'm getting to that point. I started from the simple notion of speed, showing you that you could infer speed from strength if you knew something about generation intervals, which is why our group and others put a lot of investment in trying to estimate those and try to deal with the uncertainty. People care about strength because then it has to do with size. And then I go back to one of my first slides, which showed you the infection fatality rate. If you had a sense of size and you knew the infection fatality rate, you would make predictions like the following. 
from the Imperial College of London group, deaths per day per 100,000, March, June, US predicting 2 million, Great Britain 500,000, various simulations. The reason why you get to these numbers really almost by back of the envelope calculations is that you get something like 60 to 80% infected in this simplified model. And if you take that disease with something which has an IFR a little bit less than 1%, then you get these kind of numbers. There are many caveats. I will bring up some of the caveats is that we're not particles in heat bath. There's all sorts of reasons why these models seem too simple, but they give a magnitude of concern. Now, many years ago, some of these same numbers were put out in terms of the Ebola virus disease outbreak because it also had a sufficiently high R0 and the infection fatality rate was much higher, something 50 to 70%, right? Rather than something like less than, point, less than 1%. Nonetheless, it didn't spread globally for all sorts of reasons. And maybe at the end we can talk about it in part because if you got Ebola, it was a very bad disease, very high fatality rates, worked with folks at the CDC who traveled to West Africa. You know, there was all these efforts just to isolate people rather than necessarily treat. There were these Ebola treatment units, but the treatment was very limited. For SARS-CoV-2, many people will have mild or asymptomatic cases. You would think overall that might be good news for the population level impact, but it turns out that's actually bad news. And I will also unpack that a little bit more Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm not sure which day I'll do it, depending on time. But even conceptually, I want you to think about it. If everyone had an asymptomatic case, or nearly so, we'd be back to common flu, like mild cases, common cold, mild cases. And we wouldn't have any fatalities, though many, many people would be sick. If everyone had a severe case and transmission was linked to symptoms, eventually we would notice that person is coughing. Coughing denotes the onset of transmissibility. You could isolate and it would be easier, even though the outcomes per person will be worse, it might be easier to stop spread. An asymptomatic route means a number of people feel fine, transmit, and they become routes of transmission, even if the endpoints are other people who are symptomatic. I will talk more about this, this next week, but now you can see why people cared so much about strength estimations because strength implies size with the IFR implies a major problem. I don't know if that's seeable. Yes, it is seeable. The problem though, was that this notion of a disease that goes up and down, the response of course were lockdowns. There were no other pharmaceutical interventions available. So it was non-pharmaceutical interventions. And these disease dynamics tend to have the characteristic that they go up and down. This led to some serious confusion. In the United States, the leading group in terms of being recognized or being well known in the both modeling, non-modeling community, especially the non-modeling community, is this IHME model out of University of Washington, Institute for Health Metric Evaluations, funded by the Gates Foundation. And they made predictions like this many times over. So and I've been on the record of saying this, they took deaths per day in April and looked forward and said, by mid-June, COVID over in the US. They did this many times. They said this many times. One of the reasons why these predictions were made is in part because if you take these simplified models, this is all they do. They go up and they go down. Now, you could drive them with some external lockdown and say temporarily they're going to go down, but when you release that lockdown, they go up and down again. They don't do many other things. It was actually worse than that. They didn't even build these kind of models into their prediction tools. They went back to something which was called FAR's law, which is they see that this looks pretty symmetric. And so instead of building a model, it's kind of complicated, they use what everyone should not do, the ERF error function. They use the ERF error function. Why wouldn't you want to use the ERF error function? Well, because that's insane. They discovered, and I didn't even include the rest, that the ERF error function fit this part very well. 
Well, there's a problem with assuming something like an Earth error function or any kind of function that you have no idea what's going to happen in the future, but you're just assuming some kind of symmetry. And because of symmetry, it must go down symmetrically. And there's someone called Farr, had Farr's law, which isn't really a law, which says that you tend to observe in outbreaks, often of smallpox, but in other cases, and this is all pre-modern times, that these were symmetric. People invoked Farr's law in early stages of the HIV epidemic to say that I think HIV would be done in the mid 90s. Again, just assuming these functional forms. You should also notice if you've ever done error analysis, these are the cones of uncertainty. Well, first of all, that's a bit insane that the day that you make your next prediction, you have maximum uncertainty and the uncertainty only goes down with time. The future is never that certain, right? And it's, you know, it's good that we can maybe laugh a little bit with some reflection, but this was being used actively in the United States to justify policies, right? Which wasn't very funny. And it wasn't the only example, right? This was done by professional modelers. A non-professional modeler used the cubic function on Excel to predict a date like three weeks out, again in that summer, that it was all gonna be away. So buyer beware. What has actually happened is much more complicated and we're not gonna to get to the bottom of it in these four days, right? Not possible. Not possible because I only have four days, not possible, right? Not for me, not for any one person. There's still a lot we don't understand, but clearly these dynamics, and I've chosen a few countries here, we've seen waves, we've seen evolution, we've seen behavior change. All sorts of things have happened and certainly not even at country scales. Within countries, very different outcomes have happened at different times. So what I'm gonna to try to talk about today, now that I've given you this introduction, is how to use models to project the value of responses in the absence, especially in the absence, in, in some sense, the presence of vaccinations. How do we develop principle theory that's also useful? And it's an issue at the start, it was an issue with Delta, an issue with Omicron. Unfortunately, it's going to continue to be an issue moving forward. So I told you verbally what my plan was. I think I'm still on track for my plan. I needed to give a brief introduction to some of the main concepts. Right? And what I'm going to do today is try to tell you what theorists and theory can actually do to help in a pandemic. So it's going to, the next sections are gonna be much more applied. They will not involve as many cool equations as you often tend to think are required to make you happy in a physics lecture. Nonetheless, it's actually what people do. And in doing it, there are some things clearly that we don't understand that then inspire some interesting theory. I will now take my time on Tuesday, build stuff up and on Wednesday, get into some more features, both frailties, and fixes to address some of these simplifications. So Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm gonna try, now that you have some stuff in mind, you're more experienced in the ways of how epidemic modeling and response actually works. I think it'll, you'll view those less in a mathematical light, but more in a relevant public health light. Okay, rather than just front loading a bunch of math and just telling you eventually it'll be useful. Thursday, there'll be a digital hands-on component in which I'm hoping to do something like last week, but hopefully teach you some new methodologies how would you simulate stochastic versions of outbreaks? Okay? And how would you compare them to the mean field predictions? And you'll see that they work on average, but not in every particular case. And finally, in-class exam administered by Jacopo and Matteo. And that again, it's a wonderful feature. I get to teach the class and I'm not even there for the exam. But uh, so if you have complaints, talk to Jacopo and Matteo, not me. They'll be there, not me. Uh, but it'll be fine. You'll, you'll be fine. It's, it's, I'm not so worried about it. The only other thing I want to mention before I move on is that for those of you taking the course for a grade, on Thursday, I need to talk to Matteo about how I receive these notebooks. I would like a notebook from everyone from last week and even whatever you do on that Thursday, however far you get. I just want to see two notebooks. So let's give you a grade. I would much rather grade it on your effort in the notebooks than on your performance in this exam. Not to say you shouldn't do your best in the exam, but I'd rather have some other piece of evidence. It allows me to give grades that are less rely on an hour and a half and show that you've put some time. Okay, so all I, it doesn't have to be all the way to the very end of that prior one, 
I just want to see notebooks that you've made some effort to try to uh, tackle some of the problems. Okay, any questions about this plan? Yes. Yes, on Thursday, one of them will be from the one before. The one on Thursday, you only have an hour and a half. Whatever you get done in that hour and a half, I just want to see that you were actually present. I have some record that you did something you tried. And the other one will be more elaborated. You can work on the other one on your own time. Don't send me the notebook. I, I will give you the answers and you can compare later, but I'm not going to grade it after the course. Okay. And also, I don't want to add on. This is the end of the course. I'm not going to add on homework after the end of the course. Done. Is that clear? I'll write it in Slack so it's very clear. Okay, good. So what am I gonna do in the rest of the talk? I'm gonna tell you about what we did, and we is actually a very large number of folks, in three different areas. Knowing some of these things about how epidemics spread, but also knowing some things about the limitation of models, what did we actually do? And I can assure you, we didn't just sit around solving different versions and finding these nice mathematical answers and claiming success. So I'm gonna tell you about some efforts we did to explain spread and risk, how we built a testing program at Georgia Tech and why itself was based on some theoretical ideas and also went into some of this, uh, the issues of what does it mean for, and how do we interpret when pandemic caseloads and deaths go up and then down does that mean we're done? Or in fact, does it mean something entirely different? Okay, so let me go back to this notion I've been talking about r naught, <clears throat> which is supposed to relate, uh, relate to final size. And yet the reality is that we have values of r naught, but there's also something called dispersion, which is that one individual, if my r naught is three, I have this period of time and I have a rate, we could imagine that we have a rather narrow variation in terms of the number of infections caused by any single infectious individual because we have a rate times an exponentially uh, distributed period of being infected. We don't have a long tail. But yet, there was lots of evidence very early on. From the very start in America, and I'm sure there were events, unfortunately, in this region, Lombardy, as you all know, is one of the hardest hit regions, is not that far away. In the US, very early on, there was a case of a choir practice in which 60 or so people showed up outside Seattle. Everyone felt pretty fine. They even had some preventative measures. It was around the time that things were spreading. They were supposed to stand apart, but they were singing for a while and they were physically distanced. Nonetheless, I think nearly everyone in that choir practice, they did it twice, was infected, and then it propagated outwards into families. There were multiple fatalities in the group. Later on that year, people began to collect and notice, yes, this choir practice. Here we have 52 infected, 50s, dozens of people infected from a single event. This is not consistent with the notion of an exponential period in which the R0 is three. You're never going to get 10, 20 fold, not at least not this frequently, of these large numbers of cases. And part of that is because the way that COVID spreads is not necessarily just through an individual contact, but because when you have larger groups, A, there can be potentially more contacts concentrated together, and also because of the airborne nature of spread. So you're in a large room, even if you're not physically uh, you know, uh, shaking hands or right next to a person without a mask, there can still be large number of cases. So we were very worried about spread. And we were very worried about this early on. Here's March 10th, US daily cases. It's not even on the map here, right? It's not even on this graph. You can barely even see what that is. There's almost no documented cases. And yet that same date for various reasons, I had been worried that the number of cases that have been documented were severe underestimate of the actual cases. And I made this graph. In part, I made this graph. I'll let you sort of look into it for a second, then I'll explain it. A friend had asked me, should they go to Atlanta United soccer game, football, what you call calcio here in Italy. And in Atlanta, we have a lot of people who like soccer. In fact, this weekend, there was, I think, 50,000 people at a soccer game, which I know sounds crazy that that many people would show up in America to see soccer on a Sunday, but they do nowadays. And I was worried that with so few people aware, there were no precautions being 
taken. And yet it seemed like there weren't that many cases nationwide. In fact, kind of back of the envelope calculation suggested maybe there were two, somewhere between two and 20,000 circulating cases in the entire United States of 330 million people. It is very hard to conceptualize what that means. So what I tried to do was imagine, what is the probability that one or more individuals may be infected in a group of different sizes? A dinner party, wedding, concert, hockey game, a basketball tournament that was supposed to happen later in that week, which had 100,000 people come into a watch a basketball game, 80,000, but a lot of other folks around. And then on the y-axis say, well, how many people are infected? And then make a terrible kind of assumption, but it was the only assumption that one could make at that time. Imagine though I sprinkle those two to 20,000 cases randomly amongst people. So I make a homogeneous assumption and then just ask what's the chance that no one is sick. And that's just, if the probability of being sick is P, one minus P not sick, one minus P to the large number is no one is sick, one minus that is one plus sick. Everyone follow that little logic as I wrote equations in the air? No, only me? If I have P probability of being sick, infection probability, right? So this is something like the current prevalence, one minus P not infected, one minus P to the end, not infected group N, right? N individuals, no one's infected. One plus infected. Is everyone following? Simple, right? This is not a very complicated equation. And you end up getting these isoclines, right? The isoclines are the fact that if you have a small number of people in high risk, that's the same in terms of the chance that one plus is infected. If you have a large number of people in very low risk. And the point that I tried to make is that even then, when there seemed to be no case in the United States, effectively, there were still events that it became a pretty good chance that someone in that crowd, once you got into stadium level crowds, would be infected. And even at smaller gatherings, which meant that the chance that one case could become many was quite high. Now, I don't have that many followers on Twitter. And yet, You'll notice, in, at least in a Twitter sense, this was viewed by hundreds of thousands of people and then started to put it on blogs and all sorts of things started to happen with respect both to the attention people focused on closing events, but also obviously in terms of the number of cases, which went up very rapidly, very quickly. It says a year ago, sorry, it's two years ago now, into thousands, tens of thousands per day. And even that is a severe underestimate for the actual number of cases. Okay. And in fact, if one looks in the US at least to see how many cases were documented. In the first year, there was about 16 million reported cases. The CDC estimates about 80 million actual cases, meaning one case was ascertained for every five actual cases. In Europe and in Italy particularly, I think the number is probably closer to three, one in three, but we can have that debate some other moment. So there were a lot of unascertained cases. And so the question was, there was early evidence from this choir practice. We were worried already that large events could lead to more spread because if we have this even low probability, but if there is a gathering, then you can see all sorts of ways that this can go bad. Right? We stopped following this notion of I'm having a limited number of contacts, small probability of transmission, but rather you can get large events. So how do we translate it? So again, what is the chance that one or more individuals in a group is infected? Small group, maybe not. One larger group, yes. And then obviously the risk that uh, infected goes up very rapidly. And we can estimate that from cases and ascertainment bias. Okay, so we have something that we see the cases, but we infer ascertainment bias and there's some ways that we do that. And I don't have that on the slides, but I'll just point out in a few, well, actually I actually have some, I'll, I do have it in part of the slides. Let me I'll wait in a moment and then I'll explain another mechanism. The problem was that this initial tweet that I 
made, and then a lot of people are interested in it. What should we do about group sizes? What is a safe group? And of course, it's very hard because this equation doesn't have a number or a point that says one level of n is safe and the other is unsafe. There's a continuum of risk that spreads. But obviously, the point was that for many people, certain kind of events might not have been necessary. And those events tend to have larger n, and I'll get back to that later. And maybe we should cut those out very rapidly because those have the chance to move not just from a household, but between households, between groups, and so on. Myself and a number of others started to work on ways, how could we communicate this with maybe a, let's say, a graph that would be more appealing to the public rather than these isoclines on a log log plot, right? Which got some attention, but wasn't quite reaching a number of folks. And also I had to make it, it was very bespoke had to make it every day, do a new estimation. It started to take up a lot of time. So I ended up working with Cleo Andrews here, an assistant professor at Georgia Tech who does GIS and other kind of regional urban planning uh, work. And we decided we would actually turn this into a map in which the color intensity says the probability of that one or more individuals may be infected, depending on the event size that the user can change. And as you change this, the colors change. And you have some estimates of ascertainment bias, and we included a few reflecting uh, uncertainty. It turns out that this filled a gap in the United States. And actually, I think globally, this gap still remains. Most people have no idea what the risk is when they're going out. The chance given current case counts, which are often reported in you know, one uh, new cases per 100,000, right? People don't even know what to do with that number. Or their color codes that, again, people ignore um, after in the United States, we often go through various color code things for various security things. And eventually people ignore all the colors. Maybe here in Italy, you pay attention to it. I doubt it. Most people tend to ignore those color coded things. So we wanted to give information that was more relevant. We launched this on July 7th, worried about super spreading, worried about these risk calculations. And the first day we had about a half million people show up because it got some news sources, hit some media and spread. Thankfully that calmed down because that was insane. Also, it's a lot to try to communicate. Eventually we've ended up having more than 16 million visitors to the site, 60 million risk estimates. And it has also, as I'll show in a moment, um, spawned similar sites across the world. This changes with time. And that was the other reason why having these cases and sub-state level distributions, you can see you have intensity there, a little bit up here in Seattle. And over the course of the first summer, it goes down and moves regionally from the Northeast down to the South and intensifies throughout the South and Southeast. So it gave people a real time view of where disease was spreading and also the way that it linked to behavior. Right, and just to give you a sense that we kept this going and we have, I'll show you in a moment, we've continued to have it go even now. And that I'm sorry about, there's some crazy conversion. I'll just explain what that does on the right. For people who might have joined late, my laptop is not working. I've loaded this on a Microsoft machine and it changes things. Why are large gatherings problematic? Increased likelihood someone has COVID-19 for that reason. More potential interactions. You can imagine if everyone's shaking hands, we have N squared and certain cultures, that is what's done both when arrival and departure, but also because we have the potential for airborne transmission and spread. It's also hard to contact trace. Who are you next to in that big event? And I think you've all probably heard, what was it? The uh, Lazio Milan game that was, or Lazio, no, Atalanta Lazio, which was not just the event itself. It took place in Milan in the stadium, but it was Lazio uh, Atalanta very early on, but it was actually the gathering of people at bars and parties and so on that led to the acceleration of spread throughout Italy. On the right, if it showed up correctly, the problem is that we're never quite sure how many actual cases there are in a given moment because we have this ascertainment bias. So what people have done, and you asked me before about recovered, is instead of using viral testing to measure infected individuals, you can use serological testing to see how many people recover. And then compare the serological tests versus the accumulation of viral tests and see what the difference is. And this is how people began to understand that we were missing a lot of cases. We knew it, but we didn't know how bad the problem was. There are other ways too. One of the ways that we found, unfortunately, was to look at hospitalizations and fatalities. 
now and say how many cases three weeks ago would be necessary to explain the incoming hospitalizations and fatalities, assuming something like a little bit less than 1% infection fatality rate, which you often found there should have been many more cases to explain the current uh, mortality rates. And that's another way to get ascertainment bias. Okay, so I think I've, I've explained that. I'll just mention a few other things here. We continue to do this and we've expanded into Europe for quite some time. We've had some partnerships with folks, including folks in Italy who continue. If you're interested, it's Evente COVID-19. You can go to a website uh, and look at actually risks of an event like this. And obviously there's the green pass here and it's the same people, but nonetheless, a random selection of about 50 people you can look up to see what the risk is that one or more may be infected. And also some folks in Mexico have taken the same idea and done this, Jorge Lasco uh, Hernandez, I believe. The other thing I wanna mention is we've tried to measure impact. So yes, a lot of people have come to this site. It has taken a lot of work. We now have sort of like a whole product development team. We have people who do our marketing and make ads. We have people collect the data. We have people who have to do the back end. I mean, this is very much unlike, you know, you're here at the Spring College for Physics of Complex Systems. And yet I'm telling you about something that happens when you take an idea and push it out into the real world, you end up being faced with lots of other challenges. The thing that we were worried with from the outset is, okay, we've had many people come to the site. What impact does it have? We have an intended impact, but as you know, you can have 300 million people see a Kanye video, right? Kanye, you know, or he, has a cereal, you know, Kim Kardashian drinks a coffee. It doesn't matter. You can have hundreds of millions of people watch that. You can also have hundreds of millions of people listen to misinformation. So just because you're reaching a lot of people doesn't mean you're reaching it for good or bad reasons. You're just reaching a lot of people. So we tried to see what were the impact there and working with a team of Duke cognitive neuroscientists, we started to ask questions of people who visited the site, which itself took a long time. We have to get approval from our universities to ask a little question on the website. And what we learned is that after viewing the website, people tended to not change their mind about their willingness to have small events. And there are things that people want to do and you tell them, well, there's some risk, they're not going to change. But maybe there's some things that are not as essential. And what we found is that for the large events, people after viewing the site tended to be less willing to attend those, which was what our intention was. Is there a question in the back? No, it's okay if there's... And then we did something else which they had shown, and I'll just complete this idea and I'll, I'll let you ask the question. We asked people to do an imagination exercise, which they had shown in the lab could have effects. Imagine that you're in a coffee shop, imagine a grocery store, movie theater, graduation. And we asked them to guess what we thought the risk was in their area. And then we told them the answers. We said, you guess this, this is what we think it is. And now what would you do? And what we found is that people tended to think there was a higher risk in small events than there was and a much lower risk in large events than there was. And when we asked them what they would do, we found that the people who tend to underestimate risk actually became less willing to attend events. So here we have this intervention nudge that potentially is reaching millions of people. Now we've done this on tens of thousands of people. We're still trying to figure out its impact but you can see that awareness of this disease can actually change behavior. And that's something that I'll begin to talk to in a moment. But yes, uh, Jacobo, question. Yes, so you measured how much uh, the, the viewing the, the statistics changed the, the um, willingness to participate in the event. But do you have a measure of whether they were willing to participate the event before going at the, so perhaps I'm, I'm not changing my opinion, but I was already like in doubt and probably I was already deciding not to go. Right, so we don't have, let's go back here. After viewing this, are you more or less willing? So we don't know, for example, there are some people who are not, who are basically already overestimating, let me go back, overestimating risk. So let's say they're in that category. That's why we broke it down into pieces. Maybe this will help. This is about the evidence I have. For the overestimators, they're not willing to change it. They were already thinking that COVID maybe was worse than we think it is in terms of risk. And we tell them they didn't, you might've expected they might go out, but they're no, they're not willing to do that. So 
we, we are asking them relative because it's more or less willing. So we, have, we don't know what their baseline is. We, it's not an absolute measure. It's a relative measure. And we also aren't following them. Or, like there's not a way to actually see if they follow through on this. That's obviously beyond the scope. I understand that is a relative measure. What I was asking is, what is that? I mean, there is a relative measure measure of the uh, what they want to do, but then there is a measure of what they did actually. Right. So you don't you that don't is, have a, yeah that we don't have. Okay. Yeah, we don't. In any behavioral interactions for that, we'd have to have long term longitudinal study. These are visitors to a website, so it's beyond scope. I mean, the interesting thing here, though, is in this space, as far as we're aware, this is the first time anyone has actually demonstrated even an intentional change that we could do an intervention, because most of the time these are just released. I assume most of you have gone to some kind of dashboard, COVID dashboard at some point in the last two years. Right. But for the most part, the people who are providing this information, including the state, have no idea what it does. They have little to no idea what it actually does. Okay. So I'm now going to move to something else, which hopefully will change gears a little bit. I have two more of these vignettes. So this first part has been a large scale effort now by a team to try to explain risk, communicate it in an effective way, but also trying to measure the impacts. So now I wanna to switch to the other thing that I've been spending most of my time on for the first year and a half or so of the pandemic, or at least maybe the middle section, which is how can we use testing as a form of mitigation? I assume all of you have taken many, maybe too many tests, not of the tests from college variety. And I assume most of you have done nasal swabs, is that right? Raise your hand, you've done a nasal swab many times, yes. Has anyone ever done saliva-based testing? Only a few of you. Saliva-based PCR testing? Okay. Yeah, so the difference one is in the nose, one you spit into a little thing and you can use a droplet to put in or you shake it. So in the spring and summer 2020, and the situation may have been different here, certain universities in America basically went fully online. Georgia Tech is in a Southern state. It's a public university. And it was clear, even though we shut down in March and then went online for the rest of the spring term, the push was be for us to be open by August. And we were open by August in the sense that students were back, living on dorms, on campus. The classes were mostly online, but I was still in my office and many folks were coming in. We wanted to be able to do as much as we could, given the fact that they were there, to try to reduce spread. And my colleague, Greg Gibson, decided that if we were going to try to, if we had people there, we had to try to reduce spread or at least get a sense of how things were. And it would be much better if we used a saliva-based system for repeat testing. In other words, spit into a cup, tape droplet, put it into a small uh, reagent fold buffer, shake it, give it to someone who's gonna give you the result the next day for free, rather than have it administered nasal swab. He and I chatted and we were going to, he was initially thinking about this as being used really to get a sense of what the conditions were on campus. But after some discussions and a little bit of models, I convinced him and then we convinced the university as a whole to make a much bigger investment to actually use testing as a form of mitigation. To use many tests, not to be an indicator of how bad we're doing, but actually to improve outcomes. So I wanna explain the very simple idea behind this proposal. Here I have another compartmental model, an SEIR model. At this point, after this class, I think you probably, given just these arrows, could write down the rest of the equations, but I'm, I'm not even gonna do it, or no, maybe I'll do it, just to make sure I understand the context. So let me just explain where I'm embedding myself and then why I'm focusing on this I term. So you can imagine we have our standard, I stands for infectious, E for exposed but not infectious. So when people become infected, they move into this exposed category. Then over some period, they transition from exposed to infectious. And then they recover. 
So, uh, the first one is E, mu times E. Yes, of course. Sorry. So we have infections exposed to infectious, infectious to recumbent. There's another way to move people out. And now if we think about recovered or removed, not removed because of fatality, but we remove them from circulation so they don't infect others, is that we could test. And we could test at a certain rate. And we could also test using a test which has a certain sensitivity, a probability of returning a positive outcome if there is in fact a positive case. And that would also remove individuals from the I category. I'm not even going to worry about where they get put into an isolation and then maybe they go into the R class. And I could put it here if I wanted to, but I want to put it in parentheses to note that they haven't actually recovered. It's just they're no longer the infectious class, right? If you focus here, what you can see is that we have a competition between two processes to pull people out of the I category. We have recovery at a rate gamma. We have an effective identification at a rate omega SE. And of course, in reality, there are delays and I'll get into that in a moment. So the speed times the sensitivity gives me my effective rate of identifying infectious individuals through testing. I have two rates. We've already talked about the probability that one happens before the other. Omega SE over omega C plus gamma says, that's the probability that I find you by testing before you recover. And in doing so, that means that I'm reducing your infectiousness by that probability. If I don't do that, then you just have your normal level. If this were approaching one, then basically I'm always finding you before any effective transmission has happened. So if you take that idea and say, what happens if we have a speed of a frequency of testing that gets close to gamma? And remember, gamma has a, this, this infectious period, which is on the order of about a week. I showed you that before. It can be less, but obviously that's not a bad overall term. If it's about a week, then if I test on the order of a week, I start to compete with the infectious period. If I'm testing you once a term, once every 15 weeks, it doesn't matter. I'll learn something about prevalence, but I'm not going to make a difference in terms of reducing transmission. If you take this kind of model, simulate it with different values of R0, different testing frequencies in a community of 15,000, 75% sensitivity, 90% sensitivity left and right, what you can see are these gradations, contours, from 10,000 infected down to hundreds. And you can see also that if we can get things below about a week and we can do work so that we're driving using other measures like mask wearing, which were, we fought against our own state to make mandatory. So you have to keep in mind that people have been working in very different atmospheres with respect to the relationship between pol uh, political leaders public health and implementation in our state, we are told we had to go back to campus, but masks were not required, you could enforce it. And we said that it's impossible. We won that battle one year, the next year we lost the battle. But this year we won it. So we had masks, there was online classes. Our hope was that we actually tested at scale and we did entry testing to reduce the fact that people show up already infected, it could significantly reduce cases. And the program began basically people showing up, getting one of these little biohazard kits, a little spit bucket. It took about a minute to two minutes maximum to go in and out, spit into this container, take dropper. And even I, a theorist, could do it in a minute to two minutes. Put it in the other little buffer container, write your initials, put it in this bag, wipe stuff down, get results back on a website. The idea here was not as many people did it, that that's essentially viewing tests as being something bad and just sort of telling you how bad our response was, but actually using more and more tests to intervene and identify people who were asymptomatic, especially in this age group, rather than waiting for them to get symptoms. It turns out that this worked. Early on in the return, we had a spike up to about 
of our asymptomatic testing program returning positive, but we're actually able to figure out where those were. We knew who those people were, where they lived in terms of campus housing. We're able to intensify our testing and keep things below 1% for the entire term. And I'll just point out that a similar university in our same state, so had similar background rates, had twice as high peaks and left and stayed at 4% for most of the term. I also wanna point out that heterogeneity was expected. All this modeling work is homogeneous. We knew, and this is with the limits to models. We built these models to justify the choice of large scale testing, but we didn't just sit back and say, well, I assume this is gonna be homogeneous. We don't have to look anymore. Instead, we knew that there was gonna be heterogeneity, but we just didn't know which place there was gonna be heterogeneity. So I'll, I'll be honest here that other universities uh, built very complicated models of heterogeneity, and we just decided we would just look. Because we didn't think a part of we were gonna know which coffee shop, which fraternity house was gonna have cases, we would just observe and use our observables to try to do feedback. And this continued into spring 2021 and really became a bridge for us to drive a vaccination campaign. Right? So this large scale testing became a form of mitigation, not a reporting index of the overall state of the disease. Okay, I have time to explain a little bit more here on what we did with feedback and I have one other concept. Now I have a SEIR model, but I have an explicit ISO class for isolated, and then we presume they're recovered. You can take such kind of dynamics, run them on networks and ask questions, what happens when you do certain kind of tests? And also what happens when you use certain kinds of test strategies? What do you do with the information? Do you just isolate that person and that's it? Or do you actually do contact tracing, try to figure out who that person was connected to and test them preferentially? In practice at Georgia Tech, it, we, there was some contact tracing, but we also use something called localized testing, which is if you were a roommate of someone you tested positive, unfortunately, the roommate three days later often tested positive. And the dorm mate tested positive more frequently, people in the hall a little bit more frequently. So we already knew that you didn't have to go and call them and say, who did you interact with? You had a proximity. You were close to other people. And although we didn't know the identities of the individuals, we could redirect the, the testing to that area. So what we can then do is take this conceptually and say, Imagine we have a regular network. I know it's very hard to see, and I apologize for that with the contrast. Just envision that the lines are connected here, and here they're sort of randomly distributed throughout the network. And again, I'm sorry, there's some sort of issue with the conversion. A random testing is very easy. You test people every 24 hours, a fixed number, not everyone, a fraction. They get isolated if they're positive. And so if you have an infected node, you're not going to preferentially test their neighbor because you're just doing random testing. Okay, so you randomly allocate your resources. You can also use localized testing. You test people on the day, when you get isolated, then you test preferentially the neighbors, right? And you keep doing that. In other words, if you have this red node, you're gonna be more likely to test those blue nodes because they're close to the red node. This is sort of like the dorm, the roommate, the hall here in the other data to go, right? You're gonna preferentially test nearby. And then finally, contact tracing, you're gonna go and have to talk to that person, who do they interact with, it's a little bit slower, and you end up having these longer links. So some of them are local, but you're also gonna look farther on the network. So I understand sort of how people have, these are sort of three different classes. It turns out if you run these stochastic models, then you have to worry about delay and specificity. Uh, how good are you at covering, and it's a different sense of specificity, the probability of testing the contacts after they test positive. So a random test strategy doesn't know anything really about the contacts, so you have very little chance of actually catching one of those contacts. Localized some contact tracing potentially is very high, but here there's a bit of a delay that gets built in because it takes time and practice. And here we're assuming a very fast test turnaround. If you assume slower test turnarounds, you're in big trouble. Right, so speed, not just for testing, but turnaround matters. I wanna just share two results that give you a sense of what actually happens when you take these models. One of which, just like I showed here, speed matters. Once the number of tests per person per week 
gets to be on the order of one, this is no intervention in a very small network of 200. This is sort of like imagining a dorm sized event. You see a large outbreak can be reduced right, almost 75% just by testing at scale. If you don't test that often, you approach back to where you were before. So the, here, the number one issue that we've tried to emphasize and that in some sense, the rapid test that now people are using, which are supposed to make it faster results, though they're not necessarily as sensitive as we would like, but they're very specific. So the positive means something, but the negative, you're never quite sure what the negative means on the rapid test. Nonetheless, the speed matters. You get this overall advantage. So even though it's not as specific, it's really speed matters a lot. That's one answer. The other answer that's interesting but subtle is that if you move from regular networks to random networks, then this contact tracing strategy rapidly becomes the best strategy. But when you have localized networks, very strongly ordered networks, then there's two things that happen. First of all, the outbreak size goes down. Does everyone see that, the blue curve? So if you have a regular network, even without testing, it drops quite a lot. Does anyone have any idea why that would be? Here, there's not even any testing. You notice the blue curve is the outbreak size without an intervention. Yes? They interact with, not with everyone. They interact with a subset. So imagine I have here, this person interacts with these two in a regular network, I'm more likely to close triangles. So if this is the first person, the second person to infect, right? then I've already, by the time this person's infected, there's no more people to infect right? because they share these networks. So you actually self-limit in many ways. So you already can see that structure, network structure or spatial structure can self-limit. But on top of that, then this localized testing becomes as good it's really the random networks where once you have larger events going outside family groups, outside localized structure, that this contact tracing begins to be important. But the key is speed. The secondary issue is the way that you approach it. But we've sort of underused a speed approach, being so worried about doing things perfectly. But in fact, the speed is probably the thing that's driving it the most. Speed matters. And you can have improvements when there's local information. Okay. I'm almost done. There's been a lot today that I've gone through. I'm trying to give you the grand overview of what theory and theorists can do in practice. So let me wrap up a little bit with behavior. If you recall this slide, I explained these final size relationships early on, and that there's this notion of the herd immunity threshold in which people are depleted for this reason. There's overshoot and you get this final size. You measure speed, you infer strength, strength implies size, a stronger disease implies a larger outbreak. This is limited. In the example I just showed you, when you have spatial structure, you don't reach everyone and you can't use that assumption of well mixed models. In fact, there can be a number of differences, particularly due to dispersion, which is if I rank the proportion of infected cases, the expected proportion of transmission, here it's homogeneous. In these other cases, a small proportion of infectious cases are responsible for a large proportion of transmission. So we have these kind of, if you've seen these before, like Laffer-like curves for wealth inequality, that a small number of individuals have a very large fraction of the wealth. Here, a small number of individuals who are infected have a large proportion of the transmission. And different diseases have different characteristic ways in which you can think about the extent to which we already knew SARS, this is SARS-1, tended to have this feature, a small number of individuals infecting a large number of other folks. It turns out when you have dispersion, first of all, that says that you need to chop that tail, somehow reduce super spreading events, which explains why I was so concerned about risk and events. But it also implies, and the reason that I will explain more in detail on Wednesday, that the herd immunity threshold can be reduced. This table and this paper basically said, if we have this homogeneous structure, here we have herd immunity levels, 50, 60, two thirds. These are just simple mathematical relationships, one over R naught. 
It's nothing other than one over R naught. And by the way, this is a science paper. So now you're understanding what these science papers. Now, if you have age structure, so people tend to assortatively mix young with young, old with old, you already have a change because we've broken the homogeneous mixing. But if the activity differs, if how active we are in terms of transmission changes, then what you can see is these have the effect of lowering the values. So lowering the level at which the disease might saturate. I will give the intuition behind this on Wednesday. Why is it that heterogeneity tends to slow things down? I'm going to start it today, but I will build it completely. The problem was that some folks recognized this very early, fit the data, compared it to what they would have expected with a classic model, and reached a conclusion in early 2020. I don't know if you see the words HIT, 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 herd immunity threshold of 6%, 11%, and 21%. Because if you take the heterogeneous models too seriously, you can reach this conclusion that actually the disease will be done because you'll sort of run out of these local nodes and it will be done. Just like the simple mathematical model has problems, it predicts too large a number, these herd immunity models with heterogeneity also predict too small a number and they misinterpret what is happening. They're mathematically elegant wrong the final size ones. These are also mathematically elegant in some ways, but they neglect the fact there can be reintroductions, right? It can come back into a community and start somewhere else in a local community, but also uh, there can be behavior change. So maybe I will, well, no, I'm not gonna have quite time to say enough about this. Let me just start it. If you think, and this is all I'm going to say here, is that if you think about a distribution of your susceptibility to infection, and I'll talk more about this on Wednesday, we have a mean susceptibility, and we think people who are more susceptible are more likely to be infected and those with a lower value less. So here people are self-isolating, here they're going out and about. The entire notion of why heterogeneity can actually change the outcomes is explained in this diagram. Mathematically, I have to unpack it more on Wednesday. Here's the mean susceptibility. Does everyone get that? Now imagine you draw someone from the population with this distribution, which means what is the average susceptibility of the next person to be infected? Keeping in mind the susceptibility is scaling your likelihood of being infected. So I'm taking this, multiplying by the thing that goes up, and I get something that looks like this, where the average susceptibility of the next person to be infected is twice as susceptible as the average current susceptibility. What does that mean? It means that this susceptibility distribution is pulling out the tail. This tail is going to be pulled first. If you're confused by that, it's okay. I can't explain everything today. I promise to explain this again in depth on Wednesday. Some of you probably caught it just now. Some of you did not. That's okay. I will go through this again on Wednesday and really explain it. The result is that over time, the infection process doesn't just deplete susceptibles. It actually changes the structure of the susceptibility distribution. People who are more susceptible get infected earlier, moving it down because we have the number of people who are being infected are less, but also moving it to the left, this distribution. And it turns out this has consequences, including reducing the final size. Why? Because all the people who tended to be more susceptible have been infected early. And effectively now, our R0 has gone down because the people who are left, if they don't change their behavior, uh, are less vulnerable. Okay. I have to skip some stuff. I can't even tell you about all this cool stuff about behavior. I'll pick it up a different day. All right, there's too many things. I put too many things into this talk. I'll continue this uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. So I just want to go over some of the things that I talked about today. I'm running out of time. First, we were worried and recognized that because of asymptomatic spread, there was this issue of large spreading events. So we built some visualizations that connect current case counts to risk. Recognize that we didn't have to be passive about how COVID might spread, but rather use testing as a form of mitigation. 
And this other one, I'll just have to pick up and maybe I'll even pick up tomorrow before I launch in. I got too close to the edge here with part three, thinking about ways in which these models miss key features. Heterogeneity, we're not all the same. This is a homogeneous model. And also behavior, that we don't just keep doing the same thing throughout the pandemic, even before society and public health leaders impose lockdowns. We start to change this value of beta on our own. And so the last thought I'll leave you with today, and I will build up tomorrow on Wednesday, is we do need non-conventional theory beyond these sort of strict SER models in which, like this, if I remove that, all this is is talking about the etiology of the disease. How, what does the disease do to the person? Rather than thinking about interventions and the way that the awareness of the disease changes and also about heterogeneity. The other thing I think is key is that we need better public facing instruments. Some of you may never wanna do this, right? But if you actually wanna get into the public health or, or viral epidemic kind of field, then at some point if you've built these theories, you'd like to know, are they relevant? If you're in physics and you wanna know what you've done is relevant, you do an experiment, right? Or look at an experiment, talk to an experimentalist. But if you're in public health, then we have unfolding epidemics. We wanna see, can we actually make a difference? Not to show the world that our prediction of catastrophe was right, but rather try to use models to avert bad outcomes, to actually make a difference. Okay, and one last thought. Today's talk, I would say, it was trying to inspire somewhat for you to think about ways that you could work, not just up there in the upper left, like Bohr, doing pure basic research for its own sake, and I know since you're in the spring college, you might not want to turn out like Edison doing pure applied research and who cares about the rationale, but something like Pester, which is use inspired basic research. The idea that there's a purpose that's right in front of us that inspires our basic research and this becomes a virtuous cycle of trying to see if what we're doing can make a difference in the real world. And with that, I think I'm at time. You have coffee break your next lecture to come. I'll see you tomorrow morning. I'll pick up in part three, hopefully with my own laptop. So thanks. Okay, thanks. Great.